welcome. Thank you all for joining us here at the Chicago Public Library Bud Longwoods Branch. That's my stuff. My name is Tom Stark. I'm the branch manager, and it's another special privilege to have the Rogers Park Westridge Historical Society presents another fascinating program. I'm so impressed with this organization and all of their programs. Uh, Tonight, uh, we have uh, Ben Skianoy talking about the Russian immigration experience in the 70s and 80s. And it's a topic that's really near and dear to me because of our connection to the Russian immigrant population here at the Chicago Public Library, including uh, our recently retired children's librarian who was part of that immigration group that uh, Ben is gonna be talking about tonight. A lot of beloved uh, colleagues in the library system and patrons here at the Chicago Public Library have been a part of that. 20th century Russian immigration experience. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kay McSpadden, the vice president of the uh, Historical Association, who will uh, do some further introductions. Thank you so much. Bennett, this is your water. Um, on behalf of the Rogers Park Westridge Historical Society, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's um, Living History program. Um, I, as Tom said, my name is Kay McSpadden and I'm the Vice President of the Historical Society and the Events Coordinator. So um, I'm responsible for the program tonight. Our, our speaker tonight is Benna Shklinoy and her topic, as, you, as I'm sure you know, is the immigrant experience from Russia to Rogers Park. Um, in 1976, Benna and her family came to, the, to Chicago and they were part of a wave of Jewish immigrants from the Soviet Union. And her story sheds light on why Rogers Park and West Ridge have been attracting immigrants for more than 100 years. Um, Benna was born in, the, in Kiev in the Ukraine and graduated from Kiev State University with a degree in Russian language. Um, in the Soviet Union, she worked as a technical translator and editor. And after she came to the United States, she had a long career in information technology. She began her family story in 2004 and completed a book about her experience called Bridge from Nowhere, which was written under, her, under a pen name, which is um, Benna's maiden name, Benna Averbrook. And her, she has a website which is called Apple, theappledoesnotfall.com. And she will also have two plays, which she will tell you about, produced at uh, Piven Theater in August of the coming year. And um, without further ado, Benish Glenoy. Thank you. All right, well, Kay uh, already said uh, some of what I wanted to say, so we will have more time. Uh, thank you all for coming. This picture is of my family that was taken in 1977, and you could see that it's from a newspaper, and I'll tell you about it later. Uh, the five of us, my husband uh, in the middle there, myself, and if you could recognize me, and, uh, and our two girls, and my mother-in-law in the middle of the first row, came here in um, 1976. My parents joined us in 1977, and that's when that picture was taken. Uh, before I take you on a tour of the Russian Rogers Park, I need to give you a little preface here. Uh, in a country of immigrants, it's very hard to say that one group of immigrants is different than the other. But the Russian immigrants are, if I so, say so myself. Uh, for, for the very simple reason that we are uh, the third generation of a people uh, completely, uh, completely insulated from the outside world and uh, fed all kinds of stories about it, or tales rather. So by definition, we didn't know a single person outside the Soviet Union. Also, by definition, we did not have any expectations. We did not even have dreams about the future. I'm, I'm not going to brag here that I knew everything that was going to happen. Uh, the only thing we had was hope that the lives of our children will be different than ours. And that's 
that's all there was. Uh, we were helped, and without it we wouldn't survive, by uh, several Jewish charitable organizations, especially Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society that picked us up uh, in Vienna after we crossed uh, the border from the Soviet Union and uh, uh, delivered us to Chicago. And along the way for five months, it made sure that, uh, of course, the paperwork was done for our entry visas, but also that we uh, were taught a little bit about, our, about life in the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, much of it went over our heads, but, uh, but they tried really hard. In Chicago then, or in any, on any, in any, on any, desti in, in any destination, uh, other uh, organizations took care of us, uh, doing pretty much the same thing for a few months. And uh, here in Chicago, it was the Jewish Family and Community Services. And um, the, what I want to mention is that uh, the only things that I remember from uh, what our caseworker was trying to explain in, uh, in Rome was that we would not need to need permission to make X X, uh, Xerox copies and that we should not um, lie to officials in the United States or we will ruin our record. Five months, that's the result. Um, so on September 15th, 1976, we arrived in Chicago. The highest representative who uh, picked us up, Mr. Weiner, uh, put us in his station wagon and took us to 6948 North Ashland, on the corner of Ashland and Morse. He gave us the key to a two, to, I'm sorry, to a one bedroom apartment that was to be our uh, temporary place where we were gonna stay for up to two weeks until we find uh, a, a permanent apartment in the area. Uh, the family that was leaving already, uh, a, Rus a family of Russian immigrants who le uh, was leaving at that time, arrived a week or two before, and it turned out they were also from Kiev, and the husband in that family was also a structural engineer like my husband. So at least we had one face that we already knew. Um, uh, this, uh, the highest representative also gave us a piece of paper with the time of our appointment the next day at the Jewish Family and Community Services to see, uh, to meet our caseworker for the first time. Uh, that piece of paper also had uh, an address, 2710 West Devon. That's where the, um, the organization was at the time. He told us that if we just show that address to passersby, they will explain to us how to get there. Me meanwhile, we, um, we ran out to get uh, some groceries, and um, there are old timers here. There was a jewel on Morse, yes. Yes. and it was our, the museum and, and, and a temple at the same time for us, uh, and I mean it. Uh, when we walked up to it, the store, the door opened automatically. And uh, yes, we knew that it wasn't just for us, but deep inside we thought it was. <laughs> the, I, I will never forget that feeling. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time in, uh, in the Museum of, of Jewel. <laughs> and uh, everything was so molded packaged goods, and of course we couldn't read any signs, we didn't know brands, we didn't know anything. We were completely shocked by the fact that there was pet food in existence, and that uh, there, was, uh, there were matzahs there displayed on shelves, even though there was no Passover, and it was sold openly, apparently, all year round. Uh, as far as grocery stores, we later used uh, uh, Dominic's a lot, and if you remember, again, it was on, on Damon and Ridge, where those two streets uh, connect under a V-shaped intersection. Uh, so that was another store, and also there was a little mom and pop store on the corner of Lunt and Clark, that now is, uh, I believe, some sort of cash 
checking thing. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, there was also a brand new vegetable market on Clark and I think around Rogers. It wasn't much of a store, it was more of a shed. At the time, it was opened by two young Greek immigrants uh, who are now fresh farms. Hmm. And I still meet one of them every once in a while. He nods to me, he doesn't know who I am, but he remembers the face. Uh, one, of, one name was Mike and the other, uh, Tony, I believe I forgot. But they just started at that time. Um, so the next day, we tried to follow directions. We were very obedient that way. Uh, so we walked out and we started showing passersby our piece of paper with the address. Uh, I truly believe people didn't understand what we were doing uh, until one man uh, motioned us to follow him. He put us on a bus right there on Morse. He got on the bus with us. He got off the bus uh, with us, and it turned out he was uh, the dentist who had an office on the second floor above the Jewish Family and Community Services. So combined with the doors opening automatically, that was a good sign. Um, we spent that first, uh, first time with our caseworker, whose name was Susan, I, I think several hours. Um, we needed to be explained things and told what to do, what not to do, and what to say, and what not to say, and how to go about things in the United States. And uh, of course, most of it we, we didn't remember or didn't believe. Uh, but uh, what she told us was uh, that at that time, in her estimate, there were about 500 Russians in Chicago, about 150 families altogether. Uh, she explained to us how to call Kiev. I wanted to call my parents that we arrived. We didn't have a phone yet. So we, she explained that we could um, uh, get some quarters at Jewel. We could go to a public phone, dial, and I mean dial, not push, mm -hmm. uh, dial uh, zero and ask the operator how many quarters we are supposed to drop in, and the operator connected us to Kiev. That was a big thing for us, and then we gave advice to everyone else who wanted to listen. Uh, so um, uh, she also explained to us, since we had two little children, uh, my daughter, uh, older daughter was eight years old, and uh, my younger daughter was 22 months old when we arrived. So she told us that any time we needed the restroom, we could ask in any store or gas station. Uh, that was surprising enough, but then we also, when we did use that uh, advice, we realized that there was toilet paper there in every, new, in every stall, and that was a shock. Uh, she also explained how to decipher uh, advertisements in the newspapers, because we were supposed to look for, our, for rent ourselves. And so she had a newspaper there and she circled things and we made notes so that we would know how to contact the landlords. Um, she also made appointments for us, medical checkups and dental checkups. The, uh, the medical checkups were done at a clinic on Tui and I, keep free, I think it's Francisco. There was a clinic affiliated with uh, or maybe still is, a clinic affiliated with the Mount Sinai Hospital there. And Dr. Sokol was, the, I think, the main doctor there who was absolutely wonderful. I'm sure he's retired by now. Um, when we went for a checkup, um, I think the next day or the day after, uh, we, were witness, we witnessed someone using an uh, asthma inhaler, an asthma inhaler. That was an unknown. We couldn't understand what the people were doing. Uh, we also learned the, about curtains in the doctor's office to give us privacy. And I have to tell you that privacy is not a word that is translatable into Russian. It, it doesn't have, there is no word. Could describe it, but not one word. Uh, the, dental, uh, the dental appointments were all at, uh, at the Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, that's where we discovered dental anesthesia. Well, meanwhile, we started looking for an apartment. That improved our English very much because everyone spoke with a different accent. 
Uh, and in the beginning, we couldn't even understand what they were saying, as I'm sure they didn't understand what we wanted. But uh, we were told that five of us will need a three-bedroom apartment. We were very scared that we would not have a job uh, to, to pay for a three-bedroom. So we were looking for a two-bedroom, and the caseworker also told us to only look in the East Rogers Park area and never venture west of Western. We followed it to Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, well, finally, um, finally, we were able to rent an apartment on 7004 North Polina. On the corner was Polina and Lunt. Uh, the the landlord and uh, and also janitor there was his name was Ilya. He was from Serbia, so his accent was similar to ours. And uh, he also knew a few Russian words, and we could understand some Serbian. Uh, he, he had an apartment that was just that morning um, uh, vacated, or people were evicted, the family of drug addicts. And he told us that the rent was $240 a month, but he would take $10 off if we agreed to clean it and uh, we earned our $10 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, that apartment was in shambles. We could not even walk, the floors were covered with garbage to the point that Ilya and my husband took shovels to, to put the garbage into black garbage bags. But we were very happy because we saved the $10. It was a lot of money for us at that time. Uh, he, uh, our apartment was next door to him, to his, and he had three young teenagers uh, so he liked us so much that uh, a year later when uh, the lease was due for renewal, he took $15 off uh, rent. I think that was the only time in history that rent was lowered <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, uh, then, um, the case wor our caseworker ordered the telephone to be installed in our apartment and told us to not try and bribe the installer. <laughs> and it was a good thing she did because we would have. Uh, we uh, we uh, enrolled our older daughter at the Eugene Field School and that was a fiasco because she was used to the strict discipline in Soviet schools and he, there was not even anything close to discipline at this school. And she was scared, her English was very uh, limited. Uh, she did not progress as well as we thought she should. So our caseworker helped us to uh, enroll her in a Jewish uh, Orthodox school. If you know, uh, it's um, not the full name, but part of the name is Beis Yaakov. Mm -hmm. And that school was located on Rosamond and I can't remember the street, one, one block west of Western. This school is now on Peterson, about 3200 or 3300 Peterson. Um, across the building, uh, ac across the street from, from us, there was a building where we were very surprised to discover people of working age not working during the day. In the Soviet Union, they would have been imprisoned for that. So we were very curious how that could happen and we didn't have a, a notion about welfare. We didn't know it existed. Uh, there was one man that I absolutely have to tell you about who lived in that building. He spent most of his time uh, outside, sitting on the ground with his back to the wall of the building, his knees drawn up to his chin. And that's how he sat. And so we were used to seeing him, and he probably was used to us by then. When, I, uh, when he saw our daughter uh, coming from school, he would go over to her, take her by her hand, and cross the street with her. With her. And we appreciated very much, we didn't have enough English to say that. But what I'm very grateful to him for is uh, for what he did next. About a year later, we purchased a car. It was a used car, tank-sized and tank-colored. It was a Ford 
Galaxy 500. I don't know if anyone even is, I just remember the, the model. And it was pretty much drinking gas. Uh, the, the, it was about five to seven miles per gallon. <laughs> And my husband knew how to parallel park it, but I didn't. So if I was without my husband, it would take me forever to try to parallel park. And then I would still end up with the car half in, in the middle of the street. After a while, this gentleman uh, just couldn't take it any longer. So he, he, he got over, he showed me away into the passenger seat. He got into the car and he parked it in a split second. <laughs> I, I, I looked at him like he was Houdini. I, I, I could not understand that. I started watching, and, and it was a ritual with us. I would drive up, get out of the car, not even attempt to, drive, to park, and he would come and get into the car <laughs> and park the car. <laughs> so he was my personal parking assistant. Uh, after a while, I, was mimic I started mimicking his moves, and I got the hang of it, and I could still park. I just parked in front of the, of the library, parallel park, <coughs> very well. Um, uh, what, uh, there were some things that were American things that we learned uh, very quickly. We learned to pick up uh, various very nice things in the alleys, uh, some furniture um, or whatever else. We couldn't understand why good things should be thrown out. Uh, we also learned, as soon as we bought the car, we learned about garage sales. So we would go there and buy various accessories or kitchen stuff or whatever and clothes. And some clothes was new. We would either use it or send it in parcels to Kiev and got a lot of thank yous from there. As soon as we got, uh, our, received our social security numbers, we um, opened an account at uh, a bank on Clark, a little south of Lund, there is still a bank there, of course a different one. That other bank had the name of like com commercial maybe, I forgot what the name was. Oh, it was commercial? Ah, yes. I remember. Yeah, first yeah. commercial. First, uh, that's, okay, yeah. They just changed their name. Oh, it's the same bank, they changed the name. Okay, yes, I, oh, good, good to know, thank you. It was quite an experience, and we told, uh, when, when our um, caseworker told us that we are supposed to open an account because our stipend from them would come by check, and then my husband found a job, and of course his, he got the check at work, not cash, that, like we were used to. Uh, she, we had to have a, 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 an account, and we tried to explain to her that since we were not rich, we could not have a bank account. She said that there was no problem and we didn't believe her. So we went to the bank, we were very scared and uh, we asked to open an account and there was no problem. Uh, we, of course, immediately, both my husband and I were avid readers. So we registered at the library on California, the California branch, and Tom, you would appreciate that. Uh, the first time I walked in, I went to the front desk and I said, how do I find good literature? That was my question. Uh, and I don't know what the person thought, but she pointed me to a stand that he had the name Sol Bellow and Pulitzer Prize. Now, I didn't understand what it meant, and I never heard of either, but I figured that there was a prize, then the author is probably good. So I, it was Humble's Gift, if anyone is familiar with, with Sol Bellow. Uh, so I very, very bravely, I checked out Humboldt Gift. And I, I, those who are familiar with Sol Bellow know he is not for off the boat immigrants. So I started reading, it took me I think three days to read a page or a page and a half. Mm -hmm. And I can't guarantee that I understood everything. Uh, but eventually I did finish the book and I became his fan. It took a long time. Um, uh, by then, uh, our, uh, there were several Russian families already living, uh, living on um, 1704 or the other ent entries in, in that building because Ilya figured that Russian tenants are very good. So we, we started, we, we had a good reputation there. 
Um, on May 7th, 1977, my parents arrived in Chicago. They turned out to be the thousands immigrants, Russian immigrants in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So they were greeted at the airport uh, by a throng of reporters and, and photographers. And neither, we couldn't understand what was going on. They kept asking, my parents of course did not speak English, they just got off the plane, they were very anxious and they were not young. And all of a sudden, the reporters are asking them, how do you feel about seeing your children again? And uh, well, uh, we finally got through to them. And could you, uh, yeah, the next one I think would be, yes. Uh, that's, the, um, that's one of the uh, photographs that was taken. It was taken by um, a reporter from a newspaper that I don't remember the name of. Um, he received, uh, his name is John H. White. He received uh, a reward for that uh, picture a year later. A few, several years later, and unrelated to this picture, he received the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so that's my mother and my older daughter and me there in the background. A couple of days later, uh, Chicago, Tri Chicago Tribune reporter called us and asked to come over and interview us and take some pictures. And we pretty much automatically just nodded. And uh, so she came over, the next one, yeah. The, these, uh, she, she took some pictures, she took that family picture that you saw in the beginning. She also, she took other pictures. This one was uh, at this mom and pop store on Lunt and uh, Clark. My, my parents making their first, per, um, first purchase and my mother is watching like a hawk there. <laughs> uh, that's the first time they used dollars uh, in, in their lives. Mm. Uh, we also had a full, a full page um, cover, a full age, a page um, spread. spread in, uh, thank you, in, uh, in Chicago Tribune, that would be next. If, yeah, uh, that's just a piece of it. Uh, there were some other newspapers or magazines that came over, but I don't remember much of that. I don't have much of, uh, of the material from there. Um, now, my, uh, my, my parents eventually learned some English. They didn't need my help. They did everything themselves. They were very independent. But in the beginning, I, I had to go shopping with them. And uh, when we came to the veggie stand that became Fresh Farms, my mother looked at the receipt and noticed taxes on the bottom. And she asked me what it was and I explained and she said, this is silly, I'm not paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my mother was not the person that you wanna argue with. So I, I, I simply told, that since, since she didn't know English, I told the salesperson who was one of the owners, uh, I explained what happened, I apologized, and I said, could you please that take their, her money without the taxes, and I add the taxes to my bill. And I was very embarrassed, and he said, don't worry about it, I'm an immigrant too, and I also have parents. <laughs> <laughs> so she did the same thing, and that's what happened. Every time he walked into that store, which was like two, three times a week, they knew not to make her pay the taxes, and I paid the taxes. Mm -hmm. And she told me, see, you're a pushover. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, same, the same thing happened in a store, there used to be a shoe store on Devon, a little west of Western, town shoes, town with an E. And uh, well, the, the owner there spoke Yiddish, and so did my parents. So they didn't need, unfortunately, they didn't need interpreting. So when my mother bought shoes there, she immediately announced to the owner that she's not paying taxes. <laughs> she, <laughs> he, <coughs> he looked at me, he was bewildered. I explained to him what happened, and I said, if you trust me, I will stop by later, after I drop them off, and I will pay the taxes for them. And he, just said, forget it. So every time, uh, and it wasn't frequently, but still, every time they only went to that store and she never paid a penny of taxes and he never said anything to me. So, uh, 
So here I am, I'm admitting my guilt here, but I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations has expired <laughs> since then. Um, she got used to it later, sort of it, seamlessly. She stopped talking about it, paid the taxes, and that was it. But in the beginning, that was, uh, that's how it was. Um, the first Russian food store, uh, grocery store, app, uh, opened, uh, it was uh, on Ravenswood, right next to the, or across the, across Ravenswood from the Morse L station. The two people who, st it was a tiny little thing. The first uh, people who, uh, the, 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 the two people, the two families that opened it, one, one of those two families was the family that was leaving the apartment, the first temporary apartment mm -hmm. that we were moving into. The name of, of him, uh, his name was Mikhail or Misha, we called him, Smolansky. Of course, he had uh, a day job and so, and so did his uh, partner, but the wives worked in the store. They expanded later into more stores and at least one restaurant, I, I'm not sure, of course, but uh, what he did also, which was a huge accomplishment, he founded a, a company that many of you are probably familiar with, that is called Lifeway. Oh, uh, Kiefer. Yes, mm -hmm. the Kiefer, yeah. That's how we called him, affectionately. And the, in the, in the old timers in the community refer to him as Misha Kiefer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, unfortunately, he passed away at a relatively young age. His daughter, Julie, is now a very successful CEO, and the company is traded on NASDAQ. Um, uh, more Russian stores and restaurants opened very quickly in quick succession. Some of them went out of business quickly, some existed for, for a while, some moved to the suburbs. Uh, there was a, a store, uh, a grocery store on Divan, uh, Three Sisters, if anyone noticed that. It was Asturian. A, uh, three Sisters, it was the grocery store on Divan. I have no idea. Uh, and it, it, it was in business for a long time. Actually, there were two sisters that uh, opened it, but three sisters sounded like Chekhov, so, <laughs> so that, was, uh, that was the idea. Uh, there were also restaurants. The first Russian restaurant was uh, called Troika, and it was on, uh, on Sheridan near the corner with Devon. It was a tiny thing. I don't know how long it was in business. Uh, and then, of course, of course, now there are a lot of restaurants, some in the city and most in the suburbs, Arlington Heights and that, that area, um, Glenview. Uh, there was a restaurant also on, uh, on Oakley, I believe, and Devon that was called Kafkaz, which means Caucasus. And, uh, and my, my husband even hosted uh, his school reunion there in 1983. Um, well, about two and a half years after we emigrated, we, um, we moved up in the world. We rented an apartment in West Rogers Park. I was already a computer programmer, and uh, so we had two incomes, and we were able to um, afford a, a, a large three-bedroom apartment on 6130 North Washington. People who arrived uh, in the in the 80s, and uh, you might not know that, but the immigration, uh, so the Soviet Union stopped the immigration at the end of 1979. It did not resume it for about eight years. Mm -hmm. So when it resumed, people for some reason were directed by their um, caseworkers to look for apartments in West Rogers Park. I don't know what the reason for it was. Some actually still went to East Rogers Park that was cheaper, but that's how it was. The, uh, our seniors in the community almost lo all lived in, uh, in government subsidized housing because of course they had no income and they were on public, uh, on, on welfare. My parents lived in a building next to the um, JCC on Tui and Kedzie, yeah. and uh, I and uh, I know there was uh, there were several buildings. 
uh, most seniors, most Russian seniors moved to the suburban government subsidized buildings because they followed their children. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, there is a, a building that was uh, the best known, I think, out of subsidized buildings, uh, high rise on Devon and Sheridan, uh, that is called in the community Grandma's Building or Babushka's House, Babushka's Building. Um, so um, now, it's, it's a difficult question. I was trying to come up with specific reasons why Rogers Park was so dear to me and why it was um, so good for us when we just arrived, and I really could not. But I think that um, a lot had to do with the fact that almost everyone we came in contact with came from somewhere else. Everyone was an immigrant. It didn't matter from where. Everyone was an immigrant. We had uh, a family we became friends with in our building. She was from P Filipinas. Uh, our, uh, she was a Filipina. Uh, um, uh, the Ilya was, of course, from Serbia. Uh, uh, dry cleaner was from Hungary. I, I mean, and the questions, the conversations were, where are you from? And you tell them, and then they tell you, and I am from. And that was how every conversation went. You didn't need to know the name. And it, it, it made you feel comfortable. We never felt inferior. We never felt self-conscious. Even though those people, of course, had been in the United States for a long time, and, and we didn't, but it didn't really matter. We never, even the thought never crossed our minds that they knew something that we didn't, which, of course, they did. Uh, so um, it, it, Rogers Park was, is like an incubator for American citizenship. I couldn't find another board. Now, as I said, we didn't have any expectations or any dreams. And of course, now that I look, look back at our lives, I think that if we could dream, we probably would have dreamt that life that we went. Um, it was a very ordinary life, trust me. We worked very hard. I'm retired, my husband passed away. Uh, my children have their families. Uh, everything is very, very middle class and, and ordinary. But I think that's what I would have wanted. And uh, what would never occur to me is that I would start researching my family. Because all of a sudden, I discovered that my children really didn't know anything about my former life. Uh, so I researched the family. I created a website, a blog. There is information here that I, uh, I encourage you to, to pick up. Uh, you could contact me, you could send me your, uh, your stories if you want to. Please follow the blog, like this, the, the site. Uh, and as Kay mentioned, of course, that even, even to the, if I couldn't even imagine that I would ever think of, of my, my story, my family's story, my family was always very ordinary. We had no heroes, we had no villains, we, we were just, just one of zillions. And uh, it was staged, it was staged in a part of the family based on the site, was staged in Providence, Rhode Island, and we had three performances, all three were sold out. And uh, they were, and I was very, very pleased that after each performance, the entire audience stay, stayed, stayed back to ask questions. And that was the most <coughs> gratifying experience, probably. Uh, we, uh, again, I'm, I'm gonna repeat what Kay already said. Please uh, go on my site, there is information there, contact me. Uh, we will have um, the, that same uh, play, and plus another play will be performed at Piven uh, in the second, uh, second uh, half of August of this year. Uh, now, uh, and um, that's it. Also, my, uh, my granddaughter that was born 18 years later after, I, after we emigrated uh, got a grant from, uh, from the Russian Jewish Division of the Jewish Federation of Chicago to produce a short uh, film 
about her millennial understanding of, of, of her roots and of her cultural identity. And uh, that's it. If anyone has questions, sure. I couldn't get here earlier, but I wanted to ask you, my, my father's family, they came from Prelukey and Vinitsa, and I wondered if there was anything you could tell me about that. What I've never heard of it. Uh, I, I don't know. It's uh, in the Ukraine. Yeah, I understand. Ukraine is a big country. I, I really No, I, I just was curious. No, unfortunately, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so obviously you want to get out of Russia, which makes perfect sense yes, to me. Yes, you did. Um, but not everybody made the journey, you know, not everybody decided to go. What, how did it come to be that your particular, you and your husband, you know, acted on it? It, at that time, I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, I think there, there was a you know, joke, or maybe it wasn't that much of a joke at that time, that uh, brave people stay and cowards leave. And that probably explains, in a nutshell, that's what it was. We were more scared of staying than of leaving. And uh, as soon, of course, we didn't know immigration would happen for 40 years. It, it didn't, but when an opportunity arose, we just sort of jumped and didn't ask any questions because we, knew we didn't have any answers. And that, that's all there was. The immigration was, uh, and I, I forgot to mention that, the immigration was Jewish immigration for the most part, especially in the 70s, not because only Jewish people wanted to leave, trust me, but because the Jewish people were the only ones who didn't have a home uh, in the Soviet Union. Armenians had Armenia, and Georgians had Georgia, and Lithuanians had Lithuania, and so on, but Jewish people did not have a home. Jewish was considered a nationality, not religion. Religion did not exist. So when, when uh, after the Six Day War in Israel, all of a sudden, I don't know how, because there was no official information <laughs> anywhere. Everything was grapevine <coughs> information. Uh, all of a sudden, we realized that there was a home and we could go there. Not everyone went to Israel. Some went to the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. I know some in, even in Germany uh, at that time. But that was the only reason. There was no re I, I can't say that there were any, we were not dissidents. We were not uh, persecuted. We would have been <laughs> if we did if said something that we thought. But uh, so that that was the reason. That just fear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the eighties, my husband and I worked with an organization, Chicago Action for Soviet. Oh yes. We were trained, and we went to the Soviet Union mm -hmm. to see refuse Nicks, mm -hmm. who had all lost their jobs immediately on declaring. They right. lived multiple families in apartments. Did any of that happen to you? And also, we used to have families come for yuntas through Federation, mm -hmm. well, the yuntas. Mm -hmm. Did you ever do that? I and mean, we're still friends with the people who came for Pesach and everything. Right. And uh, no, no, nothing. Actually, as I said, uh, we were just too ordinary. Nothing actually happened to us. Somehow, somehow we, we were able to get out. We were never refused next. Uh, the refused next uh, for what, uh, reasons of security or, or whatever other sort of official reasons, uh, that happened in the 70s too. But when the immigration stopped in uh, 1979, the Soviet laws did not have grandfathering clause. So if you do something according to the law, but the law changes, that's it. So uh, that's how most of Refusenik's, the Refusenik came about. Anyone who, uh, anyone who, and I, we were, paranoid about the, the law uh, changing, a law, if there was a law, we did, really didn't know what the law was, but if there would be a directive to stop immigration, then would it, we had to quit our jobs immediately because we couldn't apply without qu quitting our jobs. So that was, that was the, actually we applied, uh, we, we had to resign voluntarily. So no one was fired. Everyone resigned voluntarily. <coughs> yeah. You said that you're from Kiev. Right. When you were going to school, were you taught about Babi Yar? 
Well, we didn't. We were not taught about Babi Yar specifically. We knew we lived actually at some point for for some years near Babi Yar, and everyone knew about it. It was never the the first memorial there was opened in 1977 or late 1976 after we left. Mm -hmm. For going there on the anniversary of that massacre, people would go to prison, even if they just if they had relatives who they knew perished there, and they would come to that place, they were watched, and they could go to prison. So we knew about it. I don't know how to sh answer that question differently. Uh, and it was always, even on the memorial, on the main memorial there now, uh, the, the sign says that uh, 100,000 Soviet citizens were mm -hmm. killed. There is not a word Jews, even though 90% of course, they were not only Jews, I'm, I'm sure, but 90% <coughs> were. So there was not even, a, they were Soviet citizens. And that was the policy, and that's why there was this, this paranoia that if you, if you show respect to, to, to the Jewish people or, um, or empathy, then it, it was just against anti-Soviet. Uh, that's somehow, I don't see the logic behind it, but that's how it was, yeah. Yeah. Um, how long so you resigned your jobs yep. and then came to the U.S.? How long was it between between uh, resigning your jobs and getting and getting, getting out. out? Yeah. Uh, on average, it was about three months, and that's what it took for us. Uh, for some people, it took longer, and sometimes there were reasons. Sometimes there, no one knew actually what the reason was. You never knew. Uh, I guess, looking back, we learned that the time when we left was a very opportune time politically because the Soviet Union uh, wanted the United States to give, to give the country the most favored nation, uh, nation status. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amendment to the Trade Act that was, that was um, I don't think it went through uh, in, seven, in 74, maybe later. But at that time, it was already discussed in, in, in Congress. And it was, it was supposed to establish a link between, uh, between trade and, uh, and immigration. And the harvests were terrible. There was, I can't say there was nothing to eat. We always ate. Some were never very hungry. But you had to stand in line. That's the line for toilet paper. Oh, oh my God. Uh, could you, let, let's just go over. I don't remember what exactly what they have there. Ah, that's the line for something meat. I don't know what. It's not even a line, but that's how it was. That's the line for shoes. Hmm. It was impossible to get shoes, just impossible to get shoes. Line for bras. And that's how we try it on. <laughs> and that's the line for beer. <laughs> oh, and that's, that was uh, women's equality Soviet type. That's, uh, that's how women worked, and their bosses were men. So um, life was very difficult. We spent our lives in lines to get something. And the Soviet Union needed, uh, needed uh, trade. It needed bread from the United States. So when that, and that was very, very much a reason why the, the, the process of getting, letting people out was somewhat relaxed in our time. And then why did it end up uh, I, I think, and I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think it had to do with the uh, war in Afghanistan yeah. at the time the Soviet, and, and whatever happened there. Of course, people already here didn't want to even listen to what was happening in the Soviet Union. Uh, so, and, and, that's, and then the Olympics and whatever. At that time, yeah, they just uh, decided to punish the United States, and they stopped the immigration. That's the logic. Yes, I'm sorry, someone here. Yeah. Did you uh, have a choice of going to the U.S. or Israel? Okay, uh, yes, we did have a choice. First, uh, when the immigration began in, uh, I believe, uh, 
very late 1960s, soon after the uh, Six Day War that was in 1967. And some people started leaving, very few people, but, but uh, some uh, very famous, well-known people who were Jewish started applying for immigration. And of course, they were all over the TV and newspapers and were smeared, you know, their reputations were smeared. And uh, many of them did leave. Uh, so of course, we were too scared at that time. To, we were not famous at all, and we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, but uh, at that time, it was only Israel. After that uh, jackson Vienna commandment, uh, was passed or was about to be passed, the United States decided that they are going to accept Soviet immigrants too. And so did Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And that's how, and so people could, uh, could choose. Some people still went to Israel, some, some didn't. Um, that's, yeah. Why did you choose? US yes, uh, for a for no, no, we knew we knew nothing about any of these countries. Uh, the reason it's not even a reason when I look at it now, but at the time, my husband he had a congenital heart disease, mm -hmm. and uh, he was always very afraid that something happens to be to him. What's going to happen to us? You know how men are. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so. Uh, First, of course, we were going to go to Israel. There was no question. Then when other countries came, um, uh, be, uh, became a choice, he said that he is afraid. He, he was born before the World War II. And he remembered, he was evacuated somewhere, and he remembered how badly uh, young men who were not in the army, for who knows for what reason, uh, were treated. In if, if he said that uh, he, he was in a gang of boys, who would throw dung at, at, uh, at young men who were, if they met, they just assumed they were um, deserters. And he, knowing that in Israel there are always wars, he was very afraid, he looked very healthy. He was very afraid that something like that would happen to him, since we had no idea how other countries looked. L much later, we realized that he already aged out of the army. Surely you saw movies or television shows. Oh, no, 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 oh, no, no, no. Had we seen movies or shows? No, 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 we would, no, no. No, that was not even. Uh, Israel was a country of weaklings that couldn't hold a rifle in their hands, that spent their lives in the synagogue and did nothing. Until six, the Six Day War. Overnight, Israel became the aggressor. And that was the story. That was all we heard. I mean, I mean, all 100%. We did not hear anything else. So we had to make our choices and uh, make our decisions based on on that. So it was pretty personal. For I know uh, my girlfriend that we, we went to university together. She left a, a little, uh, maybe a year after me, and. Uh, she refused to go to the United States. Her husband insisted he wanted to divorce her. She still wanted to go to Israel. So it, it was very much a personal, a personal decision at that time. Can yeah. I ask uh, two, two quick questions? Um, I never met my father's parents, mm -hmm. but I was told that they were from Chernigov. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how close that was to Kiev. Uh, you know what? I, I, I have to look at the map. Chernigov is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a well-known, it's a large city, actually. I don't know how close it is. Mm -hmm. I could do a little research, just maybe send you a map or explain, mm -hmm. you know, something. If you want to contact me, I will do that, yeah. Um, thank you. Sure. The, the other thing is, I wondered if you recalled your first experience with a washing machine and dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. We didn't have, there were washing machines. There were no dryers in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But there were washing machines. We never got one because it was a very difficult process. And from what I heard, I would not have the patience to deal with it. So we, we I, I, I gave away uh, the, the, the sheets and, and my husband's um, uh, uh, shirts to, uh, 
to a service, to a laundry service, mm -hmm. one, one, every week. Every week, I will get the clean shirts back, and every single button on, this, on, on them would be broken. Uh -huh. mm. They were pressed. Mm. So when I came to the United States, I had a nice supply of buttons with me. <laughs> <laughs> because I assumed that that's how it works. Mm. Mm. And, and here, of course, first we use laundromats. And then after we, we moved to, um, uh, we bought an apartment, uh, a condominium in, in Skokie in 1982. We had, uh, it was a small building, and we had washing machines on the, on the, in the building. Were laundromats in Russia anything like that? No. no. Uh -uh. Oh, no. Nothing to make your life easier. <laughs> that was bourgeois. Yes. That was bourgeois. You couldn't do that. We were workers and peasants. We were not supposed to have amenities. So I think you also said that people in Russia who were not working, working were jailed? Exactly. Uh, do you remember uh, or do you know of uh, Joseph Brodsky, the poet? Mm -hmm. Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Are you aware that he received a five-year sentence for not working? Mm -hmm. Oh, my. Mm. He only did 18 months and then he was thrown out of the country because of the international pressure. But, uh, but that's what it was. Men, women, if they had a husband, if they had children, they didn't have to, they had to work because they couldn't survive otherwise, but if they didn't work that, but a man of working age, he had to work. That was a crime. That was social parasitism, it was called. They were social parasites. Joseph Brodsky was a social parasite. He was asked, and that's, you could find it on the internet, I'm not inventing it. Uh, he was asked by the judge uh, what he was doing. He said he was a poet, and the judge asked him who, is, who made you, who assigned you uh, the, the job of a poet. Is that a job? Yeah, I'm sure he did not laugh, but uh, yeah, that was. Uh, did your daughters have a markably different life as teenagers than you had? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, it wasn't different as far as, um, uh, I don't know about as far as financially. We were, we were an average family, so they and I, and I don't believe in giving children, you know, too much <laughs> over, what, or, over what they actually need. But uh, they were absolutely free. They didn't have to think about what to say. I was at school. I knew exactly. Everyone knew what to say, how to react. It was instinct. I didn't have to think about it. I knew that there was another joke, let me tell you. The joke was that you're saying there is no milk in the store. Just put a jar under the radio. Because uh, on the radio, you hear that there's abundance. <laughs> And that's how it was. So if you make a speech or if you talk to someone, you will say there is abundance. But then you go to one of these lines and wait to get, I don't know, milk or chicken or whatever. Just basic. I'm not talking about luxury items. I'm talking about a can of peas, mayonnaise, uh, chicken, uh, I mean, anything, you name it, it was a shortage. And in the last year, the last few months in the Soviet Union, there was a shortage of yellow onions. And that was terrible, because if you don't have anything else, you need onions at least to make soup or, or, or a stew or something. So uh, we would stay in lines uh, for hours to get a package of onions that already smelled rotten when you got them. And, uh, and again, there was immediately a joke. If a person comes to work and smells of onions, that means he lives be beyond his means. Because, of course, in the markets, the onions existed, but they were so expensive you couldn't touch them. So, uh, yeah, so no, we, we didn't, uh, they, and they were free, they didn't, they were like good girls, they really didn't want to do something that was wild, but they just didn't have to think of what to say, where to go to school, they didn't have to think that they will not Get to, uh, will not be able uh, not be accepted to university because they're Jewish. They didn't have to think that this company will not take them because they were Jewish, but the other company might. They didn't have these thoughts, and you don't know how it dwells on you. Have they gone back? Uh, my older daughter claims that she remembers everything. 
And uh, so she doesn't have to go. But uh, she was seven when we left. But uh, my younger daughter, who was 18 months old when we left, wanted very much to go back. And we took her, uh, my husband and I, in 1997, we took her to Kiev. Unfortunately, well, or fortunately, I could not show her the lines because there were no more lines there. So I couldn't demonstrate that. Uh, but, um, but what she saw, she, she actually asked me, how could you live here? And I said, you're kidding me, I was born here. <laughs> but she, she, she stopped telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. And uh, uh, I, I remember uh, her conversations that I always quote was, uh, was, uh, with us, especially with her father, who had lived in a communal apartment. And I don't know if you know what a communal apartment is, it's, but every family has one room. And uh, whether two or 15 families, you share one kitchen and bathroom, the common areas are shared. Um, so my husband lived in one of these apartments and uh, he would tell her that and she was a young teenager when she told him, why didn't you move out? <laughs> <laughs> and she even went into a bit of psychoanalysis and said, if you didn't move out, that means you liked it. <laughs> so that was, and then when she went to college and lived in a dormitory, she called us and said, you know what, I know what a communal apartment is. <laughs> Because this is when everyone has their own room, and then at night everyone goes to the com to the common room to watch TV. Mm -hmm. That's that was her idea of the not the kitchen with four <laughs> stoves when everyone has only one burner and uh, so uh, yeah. But but we, uh, she did go and she was very happy about it. Yeah. I'm yeah. curious about your father. Was he in uh, World War II? Yes, he was. Did he was. Uh, in a way, yeah, he, he was a bookkeeper by trade. There was no such thing as accountant in the Soviet Union. By nature, he, he would have been a tax accountant probably here. Yeah, he was that type. Uh, so he, he was a head of bookkeeping for some brigade or whatever the, the military designation is. So he mainly followed the, the, the front, so he did carry a weapon. He was not, a, I don't think he was really a, a, in the military. He was, he, he wore sort of a military uniform, but without the, whatever they're called things. I just wanted to comment that I had friends that were Russian immigrants, and I went to high school from 1976 to 1980, and we were talking, and they told a, a couple of friends, they told some of my friends that they didn't grow up the way we did because there was no religion around in exactly. Russia. Yeah. So they didn't have bar mitzvahs, they didn't have bar no, mitzvahs, no, no. they didn't know what food, you know, no. ethnic food, no. any no. of those. Absolutely things. nothing. It just didn't exist. I, I, I exist. yeah, I grew, I grew up with my grandmother, so at least I knew a few words. I knew the words. Yeah. But I really didn't know anything to the point that when my children were at Beis Yaakov, I was giving them pork chops oh, for really lunch. Really I'm sorry, yeah. So <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know what it was until it, they were discovered. Not that I was hiding it, I just right. didn't know. But uh, they were discovered and the principal called me and yelled at me and I didn't understand what she was talking about. She called me at work and she said, how do you dare? And I'm like, huh? <laughs> and she said, your daughter admitted that she eats pork chops. What do you mean admit it? Of course she eats pork chops, you know? <laughs> so, and, that, and then when she realized, when she said kosher, I said, how do you spell it? And after that, I'm, it's not, this is not a joke, this is serious. And after that, she, she just asked me not to do it again, and she had a talk with them. Well, I had an understanding of that as a teenager because of my friends, because mm -hmm. of the friends that I had. And also, one more comment I wanted to make is my great grandmother came here in 1911, so she was here way before you. But mm -hmm. I didn't even know she spoke Russian until my great my, my grandmother. I had her until I was in my 40s. I was fortunate. I didn't even know she spoke Russian until my grandmother died, and I found a picture. Mm. She wouldn't speak Russian. She refused to do it. Yeah, it she was spoke painful. Yiddish, yeah, she spoke English. Right. Yeah, it was probably painful but for I her. Didn't yeah. I didn't know. I know. That's, yeah, that's terrible. Russian. Had I not lived with my grandmother, I would not have known probably most of what I wrote about in my story. Because I heard her, she was a storyteller and she would tell stories and 
and I saw her friends and they would mention things and they just stuck in my memory. It's not like I was asking, I wasn't smart enough. But, but I found an old picture when my grandmother died and it had Russian writing and a Russian friend of mine mm -hmm. read it for mm -hmm. us and that's how I found out. Yeah, that's that's pretty sad, that but yeah. I mean, it was, time, yeah, it was, yeah. Was that common when you were coming? Not as much, right? Uh, well, everyone spoke Russian. My everyone grandmother did Russian. speak Russian. It was not, maybe, she said it was not perfect. I thought it was fine. But she was very picky about language. So she, her first language was Yiddish, and that she spoke perfectly. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Russian she spoke, of course, because she had to, yeah. Maybe we have time for another question here. Mm. It, it was, that was the question I was, I was gonna questions. ask about like Jewish identity, though. We had a cousin come over in the 80s. He must have been after you. And my father said they, had no concept Absolutely. of really what being Jewish was. They knew they were excluded from stuff, but they were socialists. But the, or the in the Soviet Union, socialists. Well, they said co communist. The, yeah, the I mean, very well, funny, yeah. everyone they, automatically no was. Yeah, but but they had like no identity. No, like, like we didn't even know we didn't know that Jewish was even a religion. Uh, Jewish was a nationality mm -hmm. on the fifth line of our passport. It was either Armenian or Lithuanian or Russian or Jewish. It was a nationality. So when here, when I, uh, I became an interpreter at that clinic where I went for my checkups, mm -hmm. uh, 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 there was an application there that had uh, nationality and religion. And nationality, I wrote Jewish. Religion, I wrote none. And, and I, was, I said, aren't you Jewish? Yes. Yeah. So why did you say religion, none? Because I'm not observant. <sighs> so. <laughs> So what, what goes through you, but so, so then how do you wrap your mind around your being excluded from all these positions? Um, because we had the wrong nationality. The wrong nationality. Because, uh, nationality, nationality came from parents. Yeah. If you're 16 years old, you get your passport. If you're, both of your parents are of the same nationality, you get the same nationality. If it's a mixed marriage, you pick what you want. If it's Russian and Ukrainian, you pick what you want. If it's Georgian and Lithuanian, you pick what you want. If it's Jewish and, and non-Jewish, whatever it is, of course you wouldn't pick, pick Jewish unless you lose your mind, so lost be, your mind. Besides so, the Jews in the Soviet Union, who else couldn't, uh, I don't know, couldn't do certain things because of nationality? I mean, no one, nationality. no one. Mm -hmm. so, so when did it dawn in you, like did you, did you, you and your husband, your family wonder, like why is Jewish being bad besides the war? You know what I'm saying? Well, it's, it's I, like you, you see, you have to understand, when you have nothing to compare with, you yeah. don't have questions. Okay. That's how we live, and that's why we didn't have expectations. Okay. Because how would we know what to expect if we knew absolutely nothing? If I asked you what your expectations about life in Congo, what would you say? Well, exactly, and that was the same thing for us, for any, any country. Your expectations, not only in the United States, in Israel, everywhere. Thank yeah, you. sorry. Thank you so much, Thank you.